Happy Sunday afternoon. This is another episode of the Large Fierce Mammals School of Charm. You gotta admit, there are a few things more charming than not being dead and not being overly opinionated where your, how's that saying go? Your uh, ass can't cash the checks that your mouth writes. Oh, however the hell that goes. Anyway, we are, uh, it's not symbolic that we're here on a Sunday in my business, which involves protecting people from their own stupid mistakes and the, the uh, bad behaviors of others. Um, this is one day that the, uh, over the years we have quelled and the phone doesn't ring and it's a family day and a day for talking to people. Um, some of whom will agree with me, some of whom won't, and it doesn't matter. If you're here, let's get on with the charming. So, just to start, I'll tell a story. Talking to a client of my security business. For those of you who don't know, I've a, been a professional security consultant for 41 years. And I was talking to a, a couple who were from the UK, purchased an older house, which is a large number of, describes a large number of the houses here in the county I live in, um, along the coast um, at COVID prices. So, you know, uh, mansion prices for a relatively little old house, but they put a lot of money into making it a really nice, really nice place. Kept it rustic, wood stove and all the rest. Anyway, they purported to be outdoorsy people and as we got to know one another they found out what I do and the things that I'm interested in the things that I teach and <clears throat> they told me some stories of some unfortunate interactions they had had with wildlife in a number of parks and places they had lived misjudging the safety factor and then we got to a point where they were asking about the types of wildlife that live here and where they live I I'm quite familiar with so I had uh, spoken of well we've got obviously the usual relatively montane animals uh, moving up from rodent life we've you know the little creatures that will get in your basement and eat your uh, oatmeal uh, we have porcupines raccoons foxes and then I started getting into the wild cats which we have uh, bobcats and Canada lynx here and of course, where they live, quite a few coyotes. Um, I could see the eyes, particularly of the husband, getting bigger and bigger. And bears, of course, depending on where you live. In their case, there was a chance of that. And his question was worthy of note. He said, well, what about people who just want to go for a walk in the woods? So I stopped and looked at him and I said, what about them? Because he, he really didn't have a justification for the question, I guess, is his, uh, but in his mind, I'm reading, and from the stammering answer and the change of subject, I'm assuming that um, there was some uh, expectation that the forest would be child-proofed, if you want. Um, what about people who just want to go for a walk in the woods? Now, I've always held that one of the reasons why we have all the wrong ideas, whether we practice them or we simply live by them and thereby sort of practice them, we have uh, a feeling of entitlement because we're humans. And this comes, I think, from a lot of uh, Abrahamic teachings from the, uh, you know, you, you've got Christianity that I grew up with, and Mrs. LFM grew up Catholic. I grew up Presbyterian, believe it or not. And neither one of us count ourselves as Christian now. Doesn't mean we don't respect um, people who are. I think sincerity is important. And does that make you a good person? If something disastrous happened and I needed to park my kid or kids with you in your care while I deal with a problem, are you a good, trustworthy person by general ethical standards, not just the ones that say only those of the chosen are entitled to whatever kind of behavior um, or protections. Um, I think it all comes down to 
God gave man dominion over the beasts of the field, etc., etc. I don't feel that any such thing, any such entitlement exists. Um, when I'm out here, my view is whatever other creatures are here, um, unless somebody wants to eat somebody, then we don't have any kind of issue, and it isn't even necessarily conflict if something does, it's the way of things. Doesn't mean you gotta let, you know, a pack of coyotes eat you or your kid. You don't owe anything to anyone, but neither do they owe anything back to you. And uh, so there is an obligation when you're here to be respectful, to not count yourself as entitled and to be worthy. And that word, worthy, carries a great deal of weight with me because everything good that's ever come to me in my life has been because I followed a certain path and found this was whatever came to me was a reward. I, I found something, I was shown something, I got something in my life of tangible value, an exquisite indescribably wonderful mate, a woman to share my life with and bear my children, if you will, and so on and so forth. These are examples of things that if I hadn't been where I was, the person I was, when I was, things would have gone by. How do you, how do, you do that for yourself? Well, start paying attention to if you are placing yourself above others, when it isn't necessary because of some perceived color of skin. I don't care what tinge you are, what religion you belong to. Uh, you are a being among, of humans are just a fraction of the creatures on this planet and you've got to be uh, worthy of what nature will give you. If I come out hunting, this process begins, it's an all year long process because I, hunt 12 months of the year to know that I can know my game and that if I have to take an animal, whatever it might be, for whatever reason, that I know it well enough to be able to do that and do it respectfully, do it cleanly, do it quickly, because everything in nature is first and foremost an energy management problem, okay? It's one of the reasons why we developed the technologies for the hunt that we have. Um, the, the bow and arrow permits making the killing stroke at a distance so that the stalk can be less arduous. You can get, you can deliver it further away before the animal realizes what's going on. The rifle has increased that. But at the end of the day, it, is the, it augments the human ability to be able to deliver the killing stroke with the least likelihood of losing the animal, alerting competitors to your presence, all of these things. So the, what you're granted by doing everything right is the opportunity so that if I'm hunting and I decide that the range is good, the terrain is favorable, the wind is right, the angle that animal is at is right, and I deliver that shot, before I t deliver that shot, in that moment, it's a sacred bond between me and that animal that I will not fuck up this opportunity and do this messily, because if I feel it isn't right in the moment, I'm not going to take the shot. Now, of course, I'm sure some will say, well, what if you're, it's the choice of your family starving to death? <clears throat> well, that's not what we're talking about here, but if it was, I would bring the best of myself to that. And uh, at the end of the day, it's um, there's a lot of shots that I don't take because the law of man says I shouldn't take them. And I'm not only talking, I keep talking about hunting here. I'm using this as a metaphor for a lot of things in life. Um, but worthiness for the presentation of 
whatever good thing might come to you. Um, you'll need to be bold enough to take what's offered if that's your purpose for being there. Um, sometimes it comes by surprise because you're not out there to say, am I worthy now? Am I wor There's no test to write. There's no adjudicator. There's nobody there with a clipboard to show you how many boxes you've checked. So, um, the, uh, but the worthiness thing, um, demanding is the antithesis to worthiness, feeling superiority that you are above. Now, this is where a lot of the attitude to, against, uh, of anti-hunting, just as another hunting example comes from the attitude of non-hunters and people who believe that taking an animal's life is somehow a cruel act. Uh, even if the animal, a deer, for example, is a prey animal, it lives its entire life not in fear of being hunted, but in the absolute expectation that it is being hunted at every moment. So every bit of its behavior is governed by minimizing the risk so it can feed safely, so it can drink safely, so it can mate and bear its young safely and care for them during very vulnerable times in their lives. So um, uh, the belief is that a man with a rifle is automatically this, uh, first of all, hunting is a walk in the woods looking for things to kill. It's not what it is. If you look back in history, we understood that and somehow even those who purport to understand history believe that people were more primitive and they did this out of necessity and therefore um, they were brutish and mean. Newsflash, brutish and mean. Those people did not have a corner on. Okay, they're another talk for another day. So uh, when you come to the woods or anywhere, but the woods is the perfect example. Now, let me get away from hunting and go to foraging. In the woods in which I'm sitting, um, predominantly inhabited by a mixture of uh, hemlock trees, this three-legged one behind me being an interesting example, it doesn't think I know it, but I know it gets up and runs through the woods at night. And uh, between you and me, it, uh, it doesn't know I'm onto it. Anyway, they, um, they're, because of the nature of the hemlock forest and the mixture with a few white pines and whatnot, um, there is a, uh, a fungus that grows alongside these trees. Uh, because of these trees, and it's a symbiotic relationship. Um, along with that fungus comes an opportunistic plant called Monotropa uniflora, or the, uh, the Indian pipe is another name for it, and I have done some writing about it, and we'll talk about that in a future video still more. Um, and it is one of those things that, even though it's brilliantly white, it's not a fungus in and of itself, but it is a non-chlorophyll bearing plants, so it lives off the avails of that fungus that grows in symbiosis with the trees. And uh, it isn't unique to here. Uh, pine forests will have it, hemlock forests will have it, and the great thing about that plant is you can make a very effective uh, pain reliever from it. And uh, so you'll find it growing in clumps, and once you, it's one of those things that once you know how to spot it, it's hard not to see it. I mean, you have to know the time of year and the type of forest that it inhabits and get attuned to it. But when you find it, it doesn't belong to you, but because it has been found by you, I believe that if you have the plan to use it, not just bring it home and stick it in a vase, that you can um, harvest that using proper harvesting methods, which means if there are a clump of eight, take three stalks. If there are a clump of 10, take four stalks. If there's a clump of two, don't take any stalks. And I wrote a poem a number of years ago called A Dose of Reality, and I'm gonna recite it to you now. Who would thrive shall not disgrace his worthiness for nature's grace. In service of what needs befall, what he would take, he takes not all. The first he finds, he moves on past, so he will never take the last. So keep that in mind when you're out in the woods and you 
see one single solitary flower and you've never seen one like it and you want to pick it and take it away. That's no way to be seen by the things around you as worthy. And uh, as time goes by, you're going to need to show some worthiness. So keep that in mind until next time.